for funding this. This is, again, a unique event, and now I've come to my introduction to Jeff Chang, our main speaker, who's going to frame uh, the event for the next three days. Jeff Chang is uh, known nationally as an author on culture, politics, the arts, and music. We chose him to commence this symposium because he's one of the few authors in the US public sphere to analyze popular music in conjunction with the racial disparities as well as the recent social movements that have been springing up. As a geographer, yes, I am a geographer, um, which is quite rare when it comes to music, but there is a thriving scene of uh, music geography. Uh, as a geographer, I would say Jeff has a keen sense of how cities and the nation state shape social groups. Throughout his work, he always situates m music as a vector of hope and imagination within relations of power and the everyday difficulties minorities face in the United States. Jeff was born and raised in Honolulu. He studied at UC Berkeley and UCLA. Uh, at Stanford University, he serves as executive director of the Institute for D Diversity and the Arts. His first book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A History of the Hip Hop Generation, uh, has an introduction of hip hop pioneer DJ Cool Herc which is amazing. It garnered many honors, this book, including the American Book Award and the Asian American Literary Award. Jeff further edited the book uh, in hip-hop studies, Total Chaos, The Art and Aesthetics of Hip-Hop. His next book, Who We Be, won the Ray and Pat Brown Award for Best Work in Popular Culture and American Culture, and was the finalist for the NWCP Image Award, the Dayton Literary Peace, uh, uh, Peace Prize, and Books for a Better Life Award. And this book really showed Jeff's an analytical power uh, and he, as he surveys what race has looked like in this country from a historical perspective. His most recent book, We Gonna Be All Right, We Gonna Be All Right, Notes on Race and Resegregation, was named the Northern California Nonfiction Book of the Year, and the Washington Post declared it the smartest book of the year. Extending the public discussion of race uh, is a, at a critical time of US history, as everyone knows. Jeff's book uh, is optimistic especially about young people and university students coming together and daring to dream again about a better world. His current project, I'm very uh, glad to announce, uh, is a biography of Bruce Lee. Uh, so his writing has appeared in top periodicals, The Guardian, uh, New York Times, Nation, uh, Mother Jones, Salon, BuzzFeed. Um, thanks to the erratic spring weather of Minnesota, Jeff, I should also say Daphne Brooks, who's going to be uh, our discussion tonight, both brave many hours of airport frustration to be here. Uh, really glad that they could make it. And, um, you know, um, uh, yeah, so, so it's gonna be a great conversation between two. I'll introduce Daphne Brooks after Jeff's talk. Uh, the title of Jeff's talk refers directly to Prince's classic take on the US national anthem, America, uh, recently given new life by Sheila E. Keep the children free, Prince on the front line of post-civil rights America. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Chang. Uh, good evening. Um, I, I thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Zenzile. Thank you to all of the folks who made this incredible conference possible. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. I guess sometimes it, it really does snow in April, yeah? Um, <laughs> it was really hard to get here to the Twin Cities, um, but I'm so happy to be here. It's such an honor for me to be here in the Twin Cities, uh, talking about a Gemini no less, because for me, um, as I'm sure it has been for many of us who were not lucky enough to be born and raised here, um, you know, the Twin Cities played a really big role in my teenage self coming to try to find my own path towards freedom. And I don't think I could have placed Minneapolis on a map back then. I, I lived in a little island in the Pacific, but it really loomed large uh, in my mind, the sound, this vision of this freaky, desegregated, gender fluid, polycultural, uh, utopian bohemia, right, of uptown, where everyone had freed themselves from society's constraints. And of course, this was Prince's sound and vision, holy. I think today and in the coming days, we're all here to talk about the work and the impact of Prince. And we're all gonna do that in our radical diversity of ways, in all our radical difference. I myself find myself drawn to the image of Prince sort of bounding onto the stage of post-civil rights America. Um, an era that we might say opened 50 years ago 
50 years and two weeks ago um, with the gunshots that killed Martin Luther King Jr., which still echo today. And in history's missile arc of regress, Prince was kind of a break, right? He'd stop, drop into the splits. He'd exhort us to go crazy with a shake of the wrist and a mascara side eye. Approving of the mirth and the mischief that he'd done, like some sort of a purple Moses in high-heeled boots. Leading us through the confusion and the ruins of post-civil rights America, post-segregated America, scare quotes here, right? With beautiful music and odd digressions on sex, on God, on spooky electric, on symbols, on names. Uh, we can funk until the dawns and why we, can't, why we can't live togethers. In his book, I Would Die For You, Ture, my good friend Ture, writes about Prince as one of the most quintessential heroes of our own lost generation. And I'm inclined to agree. For Ture, Prince was a latchkey loner uh, who leads us to freedom through sex and God. And for me, he embodies our time in the wilderness between the high era of civil rights and black power and our current period shaped by social movements like Black Lives Matter, like the Dreamers, like the Women's Marchers, like Occupy, like the Warriors at Standing Rock and at Parkland. It's a time when we've seen massive cultural desegregation and at the same time, massive physical and social resegregation. It's a time when we find ourselves further from a national consensus to address these issues of racial segregation and inequality than we've ever been. I think perhaps our generation might be remembered for being one that came of age during a time of constant, constant political backlash. An era of brutal reversals that's required really unusual skills of us, right? And which Prince, in all of his vices and virtues, had an abundance. He had an apocalyptic wit. He had a coy evasiveness. He had expansive conceptualizing. He had obscure stand taking sometimes, right? He had sensational and sensual creativity. He was a master of masks in a time of masking. And when he told you that he knew how to undress himself, it was a tease, but it was also a warning. He knew his survival depended upon control of his body and what he covered it with. And so perhaps it's only now, in a moment where social movements are allowing us to take off our masks, to face up to power, to scream in the face of power our deepest desires, that we might begin to make sense of someone like Prince. So I'm motivated to talk about him this way because we still find ourselves with wars all around us. Prince's lines, we could all die any day, or police ain't got no gun, you ain't got to run. They have a very terrifying specificity for African Americans in the context of Philando Castile, Jamar Clark, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, Stefan Clark. This is a moment in which our president is also our troll in chief, the unprince. A Gemini. <laughs> He's also a Gemini. Is that the Geminis in the house? Is that what's, is that what's going on? Right. A Gemini who shows no humor, no dexterity, no empathy, no intellect, no dance, no music, sex, yes, <laughs> but no romance, right? This is also a historical moment in which 50 years since King's assassination, we find ourselves, again, further and further from this national consensus to address these types of questions. Prince's journey went in the opposite direction. He did what real leaders do. He subverted the accepted wisdom and he subverted what passed for common sense in order to move us further. As a precocious, ambitious teenager, Prince didn't begin his musical career thinking of himself as somebody who wanted to say much, if anything, about race. And yet against the backdrop of the Reagan era backlash, he came to vocalize the fight against cultural and material segregation. And now that he's gone, it's possible to say that one of his most powerful legacies is, legacies is how he expanded what Claudia Rankin's called the racial imaginary. How he enabled future generations to take their place in bending the moral arc towards justice. So I wanted to begin with a story from the fall of 2016. It was about 10 months after Jamar Clark had been shot by police. Black Lives Matter demonstrators had launched an encampment at the police precinct and a group of white supremacists tried to empty their guns on them. It was just two months after Philando Castile was mercilessly murdered in Falcon Heights in St. Paul by a policeman. In Diamond Reynolds' video, 
His fiance's video of the shocking act cir circulated around the world. I was given the opportunity to be on Carrie Miller's uh, NPR show to discuss white flight in America. And the call in show quickly became a forum on the resegregation of the Twin Cities. And it was here that I was educated on the, on the yawning gap between the Minneapolis of Prince's Uptown Imaginary, a place in which Prince and Husker Du and the replacements could all be digging each other. And the world could be digging them digging each other. And the actual Minneapolis, right? A resegregated place not so different from the St. Louis or the Baltimore of Prince's singing, where there would be no justice and no peace. That day we were lucky to have the University of Minnesota's own Myron Orfield, the nation's expert on segregation, called in. And he spoke directly to this gap, placing Minneapolis's fraught history, racial history into context. He said, we had some of the strongest racial integration policies in the country for 20 years, and we abandoned them. I think we really paid the price. And what is that price? Minneapolis has the lowest rate of black home ownership in the country. Its schools have resegregated at a horrifying pace. The number of schools in which students of color are more than 90% of the student body has doubled since 2002. Racial achievement gaps in Minneapolis schools are among the highest in the country. It could be argued that Minneapolis has fallen further and faster than any other city in the north, except for where I'm coming from, the Bay Area. The Twin Cities were once considered a leader in national desegregation. Orfield wrote, Minneapolis was the first large city in the country to enact a fair housing ordinance. And Minnesota was one of the first states to pass a civil rights law outlawing housing discrimination. And as a result of the desegregation order in the 1970s, he added that the Twin Cities became, quote, one of the most integrated metropolitan areas in the US. And so I emailed Myron after the show and I said, yeah, it seems like the era that we're talking about in which the Twin Cities were at the forefront of desegregation may have been the, area that, the era that produced Paul Westerberg and Tommy Stimson and a 17-year-old athlete and musical prodigy named Prince Rogers Nelson. It's about right to say that. And he replied quickly, he said, you're right. I had the privilege to go to junior high school with Prince. So perhaps a brilliant Twin Cities resident will write the story about if and how desegregation helped foster the city's stunning musical and cultural breakthroughs in the 1980s, and also what desegregation failed to do. And a good blueprint would be Andrea Swenson's essential gotta be something there, a prehistory of Prince and those who made the Minneapolis sound. That story takes us to Bryant Junior High, where Prince met uh, fellow aspiring musicians like Jimmy Jam and Jimmy Harris, and took music theory and business of music classes that would set him on a journey. There's a deep beauty to the fact that another boy who would become the nation's leading expert on racial segregation uh, was sharing the same space and time. The desire for that kind of beauty, that kind of symmetry, which itself is a kind of justice has been abandoned. And yet this justice, this beauty, shaped how Prince pursued music for his entire life. By themselves, desegregated spaces do not end racism or inequity, nor are they without their own struggles, but an expansive imaginary can arise from the heat of these radically different bodies coming into contact with each other. At their best, these spaces allow an organic understanding of possibilities outside of a repressive and a racialized status quo. And they do this because they violate the first rule of power, which is to name, to separate, divide, and rank. Instead of disengagement, people might work through unequal relations towards ways to commit to each other and to live together. They might co-create a common language, a common culture, and whether they realized it or not, in the beginning, this was Prince's calling. Music is the most social of all art forms. The party's a place of public joy and leveling. It's literally where we come together. And as much as Prince said he hated the Beatles, he understood what coming together meant in all of its meanings, right? The Prince, makes, the Prince of the early 1980s makes manifestos of his Screw the Masses sexual anthems, Party Up and Uptown and Sexuality and DMSR. When we move in space and time, aware of our bodies and others moving together, we are learning to labor towards new forms of unity, new kinds of consciousness. We're showing ourselves and each other how to work. And I would die for you this consciousness promises to take us beyond gender into something you can't understand and even bring together good and evil. So in sexuality, he's singing about 
tearing down the status quo. And then he's talking about the production and reproduction of a new breed of leaders who would stand up and organize. He offered no particular political agenda uh, or kind of solidarity, unlike, say, the Clash of Sandinista. He proposed a kind of anti-politics. But in another sense, he was also offering a radical and prescient challenge to whiteness that almost a decade later, Cornell West would name the new cultural politics of difference. Prince meant to blow up the binary logics of exclusion. Am I black or white? Am I straight or gay? To challenge the way whiteness separates and classifies, erases way of, ways of knowing and ways of being, contains and essentializes other identities, and otherwise does violence upon them. And he's very aware of what this process of othering can lead to, what it can do. Some people want to die so that they can be free. In the next de decade, even his much maligned love symbol was a radical statement, a conflation of gender symbols that suggests myriad possibilities beyond the essentialized identities of male and females. Cultural conservatives saw stuff like this as socially designed fuckery that hastened the apocalypse. But Prince positioned sex, celebration, and love as God, gender pronoun suspended, as a procreative response to the apocalypse. And as he sang 15 la years later on emancipation, uh, on the love we make, older, wiser, and saddened by Jonathan Novoin's death, the only love there is, is the love we make. So the music of controversy, which Ricky Vincent has called naked funk, is deceptively simple. It opens with this four on the floor, uh, one note bass line. And the vocal lines follow the keyboard melodies as if to imitate and mock the reductivism of the monoculture. But by the chorus, as Prince has sketched in all these contrapuntal elements, right, the guitar work, the organ work, it becomes clear that he's teasing dominant culture. Do you want to play? Right? And he knows he's going to end up on top. At the very outset of the 1980s, Prince was ushering in a decade in which artists of color, queer artists and women artists, this new breed of leaders, would similarly challenge the logic of cultural exclusion across all forms, from literature to poetry to dance to theater to the visual arts. And central to what we love about his winking brashness, the thing we hear in his signature yelp, or that universe-shattering scream, the thing that we see in his sidelong glance that says, as he did after his performance in 2004 with perhaps his greatest understudy, Beyonce, don't hate us because we're fab, is that he's been clear since at least 30 mind that black popular culture is America's avant-garde, its most vibrant, rapidly evolving reminder of what freedom looks like and sounds like. Prince's utopic musical geographies came from actual geographies. These future imaginings arose from material histories. So the history of segregation in the Twin Cities is no different than that of other American cities. And Andrea Svensson also reminds us that these segregated spaces supported rich creative ecosystems. Prince's parents met in this space and his father played with the fathers of Andre Simone and Jimmy Jam. She also reminds us that the major protests of 2015 and 2016 took place where North Minneapolis's fourth precinct had replaced the legendary black community center and cultural hub, The Way. And on the I-94 highway in St. Paul, where the black cultural traffic of St. Paul's historic Rondo neighborhood had been erased for the white suburban and exurban automobile traffic. To conflate Orfield and Swenson via the Lewis connection, the Twin Cities and the rest of the country had something there. And they chose to destroy it. And so remixing Joni Mitchell, they had paved paradise and they put up a highway and a police precinct. In 1967, tensions between North Minneapolis residents and police exploded into days and nights of fire, followed by the National Guard's occupation of the neighborhood. The black community organizer, Harry Spike Moss, told the star, you wait two or three years while this generation comes along. They see that if you want anything, you gotta take it. And so when the 1970s rolled in, this new generation, including Prince and all of the colleagues uh, that would make the Minneapolis sound, could learn and hone their craft at the way. Uh, in the heart of North Minneapolis, on Plymouth Avenue, in the wake of the unrest and led by Spike Moss. They could find opportunities to play in high school dances and parties. Uh, they could find a number of studios in which to record. Busing in Minneapolis began just months after the unrest in North Minneapolis. And desegregation brought Prince from North to South Minneapolis. He sings about it on the sacrifice of Victor. And he sings about it with a sense of skepticism. And this is a counter-narrative 
to all the narratives that we've heard about busing that privilege um, white voices about how desegregation and busing impacted them. He says, 1967 in a bus marked public schools wrote me and a group of unsuspecting political tools. Our parents wondered what it was like to have another color near, so they put their babies together to eliminate the fear. Busing put black students at risk. It begat root shock, which is that condition of longing and disorientation that comes with displacement. But it also put Prince in touch with other communities of young black uh, musicians across the, across the city, and it brought him into the orbit of white rock fans. As important as James Brown and Sly and the Family Stone and Carlos Santana was to the young prince, he also fell in love with the music of Joni Mitchell, of Grand Funk Railroad, of Boz Gags. As his mu musical innovation hit an inflection point with Dirty Mind and Controversy in 1999, you could hear him reaching for a new synthesis. He's partly responding to the ambient soundscapes and rhythmic drive of new wave artists like Gary Newman, the Cars, and Elvis Costello and the Attractions. Pop right now, in which genres and subgenres, once damned and policed, have in the endless flow of streaming music all but collapsed into an international style, feels like it's in a Prince moment. But it was not easy to arrive here. Prince had to stage a series of evasions and misdirections in order to be actually birth this world. And so one of the enduring stories about the 18-year-old Prince negotiating his first deal with Warner Brothers that would lift him out of Northwest Territory uh, obscurity is that he refused to be marketed as a quote-unquote, again, scare quotes, black artist. So the kid who came up the son of a pioneering Twin Cities black musicians, uh, playing at the Black Power Oriented Community Center, who got his first break through musicians he had uh, met through the same networks that nourished his parents and his cousins and his friends, decided that he had to seek his success by pulling away. And so he found white patrons who treated him, rightly so, as if he were the new generation Stevie Wonder type prodigy. In the segregated pop market of the early 1980s, Prince understood that a warm welcome at black radio could be a trap for an artist with musical ambitions like his. So I Want to Be Your Lover, a song that when you place it back in the context next to 94 Eats, If You See Me and the Loring Park session demos, seems like the culmination of this 1970s funk sound did break at uh, black radio first. And it led to his infamous Battle of the Funk tour with Rick James. But as his vision coheres, Prince's vision coheres, he aspires to be bigger than even Rick James, who witheringly said of Prince, he doesn't want to be black. My job is to keep reality over this little science fiction creep. <laughs> Prince secured white uh, rock publicist Howard Bloom to help engineer his crossover. And at that time, when it came to music, black men Every style that was niche and wasn't white. And white meant rock and the big money, the entire market. And so Bloom made these racial politics clear in a memo to Prince's manager. He said, the verdict from the press is clear. Prince is a rock and roll artist. In fact, the, print, the press is saying clearly that Prince is the first black artist with the potential to become a major white audience superstar since Jimi Hendrix. And as the critics imply, the task with Prince is to hold his black audience while aggressively pursuing the rock and new wave audience. In an important interview for Rolling Stone, Prince told Bill Adler, I grew up on the borderline. I had a bunch of white friends and a bunch of black friends. I never grew up in one particular culture. And in the same breath, he's spinning tall tales about uh, his mother being Italian, right? his supposed biraciality. And so if we look at it now, this might make Prince seem uh, not a little self-hating and even ungrateful, but the young star can't be aware, cannot but be aware that he's become what Eric Locke calls the black mirror, a black mask for my white face. And here too, Prince's crossover dreams presage Obama's, right? Biraciality as a marker of the redemption and recuperation of whiteness, a process that Locke calls a self-sustaining misrecognition. There's an early interview that he does with Barbara Grostak where Prince gives sort of a revealing answer to really what's a throwaway question. Uh, Barbara Grostak uh, asks him, do you feel a strong identification with anything, with anybody? And Prince says, no. I think society says if you've got a little black in you, that's what you are. I don't. Another way to understand Prince's moves is to historicize them. 
Both his father and mother led jazz lives that represented the complex joys and crushed dreams of artists who played in a segregated era. And music was a source of some of Prince's childhood traumas. His powerful ambitions were rooted in an intimate sense of the costs of representing blackness in a white world. And his experiences reminded him of how hard the color lines had been drawn. He explained why he wished there were no rules. In 1981, when they were asked to join the Rolling Stones tour, uh, va fans violently bottled Prince and his band's black bodies. Even as they cheered Mick Jagger and his band's white performance of androgyny and drag. The big payoff, better yet, the big payback, came the following year when Prince, alongside Michael Jackson, desegregates dramatically MTV and rock radio with Little Red Corvette. The critic Bob Criscow wrote, Little Red Corvette was Prince's trans-genre genius in action. Without it, MJ's Beat It might never have cracked MTV. This kind of stage-tested, studio-documented proof that rock and R&B weren't mutually exclusive. Funk patterns blended by arena scale, soulful singing intensified by virtuosic shredding will remain his greatest achievement. So the Prince of the 1980s asked us to consider the gap between what he said and what he played. Even as he remained elusive with white journalists or reflected back to them what he wanted to hear, his music revealed an understanding of American pop that was much more conflict, complex. He had no time for distinguishing between rock and R&B the way overzealous Stones fans or critics or radio and television programmers in the music industry did because it was all black music to him. So 1988, right, when Sign of the Times loses out to Joshua Tree at the Grammys uh, for best album of the year, U2's Bono says, we set out to make music, soul music. It's not about being black or white or the instruments you play or whether you can use a drum machine or not. It's a decision to reveal or conceal. And without it, people like Prince would be nothing more than a brilliant song and dance man. And then you hear Bono backing up a little bit. He's like, that he is, but he's much more than that. Later, when asked about Bono's statement, Prince simply said, I'm not saying that I'm better than anybody else, but you'll be sitting there at the Grammys, and you two will beat you. And you say to yourself, wait a minute, I can play that kind of music too. I played lacrosse Wisconsin pl uh, growing up. I know how to do that, you dig? But you will not do housequake. And all of this helps to explain why Prince demanded to be treated and heard the way that white artists were. Which is to say that he demanded complete access to the kind of critical universality that was granted to folks like you too. And so in this way, he anticipated the concerns of what Thelma Golden would playfully label the post-black generation of contemporary visual artists, people like Glenn Ligon and Carrie Mae Weems and Lorna Simpson and Gary Simmons and others who made work that challenged white viewers to confront their assumptions about race in the first place. And those artists would suffer the same kinds of indignities that Prince did. Rejection, misinterpretation, and revulsion. Prince is still said by some to have somehow transcended race. This idea of transcending race is a particularly and peculiarly post-civil rights notion. But his early culture moves seem less about fulfilling some sort of a colorblind ideal of American exceptionalism than about being strategic before a deeply segregated cultural landscape. And so what we hear in his music is blackness is central to the imaginary of America and black art as an expression of black liberation and thereby everyone's a liberation, freedom for all. The desegregation of American pop is a freedom move. The revolution seemed to propel him even further into still evolving unified theory of pop with its easy interraciality, with its strong women, which is sometimes magical chemistry, uh, the revolution also challenged him to be more revealing and open, and so a hallway version of Computer Blue, right? With its science fiction overtones, right? Reveals the band at its best, tearing through these bewildering changes at breathtaking speed. But it's rooted in a piece, of course, by his father. It's elaborated and sharpened in these long and fruitful jams with the band, and it's finally presented with the stunning choreography and staging in the movie. And so this is Prince honoring his debts and his legacy while ferociously defining the future. Amidst national attacks on affirmative action, the revolution embodied this idea of diversity as excellence before it became a mantra of neoliberal capitalism. And after the desegregation, what? Well, the revolution took on America itself. And so Prince sings of 
Cold War brinksmanship. He sings of intensifying inequality. And he also signals, actually, a Reagan-like patriotism. He criticizes Jimmy Nothing, who won't pledge allegiance to the flag. But here, too, the music and the video complicate things. According to legend, the revolution uh, locked into a monstrous groove which continued for five hours straight. And 21 minutes of this end up on the 12-inch, faded down because the tape ran out. Wendy Melvin would later say, to this day we can put that track on and feel that band's energy and feel what, uh, what we are like at our best together. A fucking freight train. No mystery train here. It was the struggle. It was a sound of struggle and synchrony. The band is the dream of America itself barreling forward in time and space. When they played the song in the official video, they performed it live in front of an audience in Nice, France with a massive red, black, and green Pan-African liberation flag behind them. So Prince had already transformed binaries into dialectics. He'd placed these opposites in conversation uh, and relationship to each other. And now here was his synthesis, right? Unfurled in this musical rendering of America, this train was bound for freedom, love, joy, peace. By the late 80s, Prince could no longer ignore the ascent of hip hop. On Sign of the Times, he countered with Housequake. It's part tribute and it's part taunt, right? Shut up already, damn. But by the Black Album, he seemed to have conceded the balance of power had shifted. And the new power generation, a band deliberately and decidedly black, Rosie Gaines said their job was to win back black audiences for Prince. Uh, they were in place when LA uh, erupted in rebellion. 1992 was a significant year for Prince in a different but somehow deeply related reason. It was the year that he renegotiated his contract with Warner Brothers. And he couldn't have missed the hip hop generation's critique of the music industry, right? Tribe Called Quest, Public Enemy, Ice Cube. By contrast, Prince is working from strength and he's leveraging what some would call the biggest contract in history. But by 1993, the year that Dr. Dre begins hip hop's conquering of pop, and the year that Wu-Tang began its journey towards securing control of their masters, Prince decided he would no longer comply with the way that business had been done. So on his 35th birthday, right, he renames himself, he announces he's not gonna turn in any new music, and he tells a crowd at the Brit Awards, in concert free, on record, slave, peace. The reaction was swift and brutal. Warner shuttered Paisley Park Records, they removed him from leadership positions, Pundits and even close friends and co-workers ridiculed him. They said, if he's a slave, he's one of the best paid ever, he should be grateful. They said he had no right to compare his condition to that of real slaves from whom he was descended. In fact, as Alex Hahn has found, his, grand, or his father shared a name with Prince's slave-holding great-great-grandfather. In a 1998 interview, Prince said, suppose you're a young musician and you want to make a record because you have something to say musically. Well, the record company usually makes you sign away the rights to your songs. In other words, you become a slave to them in the sense that they own the rights to the master recordings of your music for all time, and you're merely an employee. So if you don't own your master, your master owns you. And what we've been trying to do with the NPG label, what it stands for, is trying to create more freedom, including financial freedom, so that artists can control their own genesis and can reach a much brighter revelation, these biblical illusions. We know that Prince wanted to release more than the record industry at the peak of its financial powers could really even countenance at the time. And this is a position driven by scarcity, economics, and blockbuster financing that seem laughable now, uh, post Napster. But the more enduring battle over artistic control pitted notions of the artist as a crucible of creativity and a bearer of culture versus the idea of the artist as a commodity. If one can only imagine cultural exchange to the terms set by capitalism, the artist appears ungrateful, at worst a bad actor in a system that's richly rewarded him. But Prince had launched a sophisticated attack on racial capitalism. He was a commodity. And this realization must have had the force of an awaking, awakening. Racial capitalism was capable of building new, uh, new schemes of containment through copyright and so-called intellectual property that dispossess artists particularly black artists of all their agency. And so Prince is asking, if my ass follows, can my mind be free? And his answer is that freedom is the right to benefit from the fruits of one's own individual creativity and culture ways. 
Some things had changed in 400 years. We can now contemplate a horizon of post-raciality, distant and ever disappearing, to be sure, because of black freedom movements and black freedom culture. So Prince said in the same interview, I want to be judged on the quality of my work, not on what I say, nor on what people claim I am, nor on the color of my skin. And he sounds like he's invoking the MLK of the neoconservative imagination, the supposedly colorblind, completely dehistoricized, and wholly reappropriated king. Yet in the same in uh, interview, Prince says, but you have to have a certain empathy in order to understand a situation. Like when people made fun of my name change, it was mostly white people because black people empathize with wanting to change the situation. My last name, Nelson, is really a slave name. A hundred years ago, I meant son of Nell. And it was a white slave owners who gave it to their slaves. So why should I go by that name now? Why not do what Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X did? He wanted to take back this first order of power uh, to name. This first order of power to name. And so renaming himself connected his struggle for creative independence and his personal history as a descendant of slaves to the larger struggle for black freedom and freedom for all. The debasement of the African in blackface minstrelsy was one of the two foundational narratives of American popular culture. The other was the taming or killing of the Indian in the Wild West show. But African Americans reappropriated the elements of minstrelsy, song, dance, comedy, performance for liberatory ends, forever transforming the music and performing arts of the young nation. And ever afterwards, American popular culture claimed to be carrying the mantle of freedom all around the world, but we've never repaid the debt to those who turned American pop from a culture of debasement, othering, and death into one of community, liberation, and life. By writing Slave on His Cheek, Prince did what Martin Luther King Jr. had done in August 1963 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. He called upon America to acknowledge and repay the debts it owed African Americans. King had called for political enfranchisement. Prince was calling for cultural equity and cultural justice. And in this light, it makes perfect sense that in his final years, Prince would be galvanized by a new breed of leaders, mostly queer black women, who had named the stakes and connected cultural power and political power to the central question of black lives. So Prince's tour schedule became a way for him to quietly meet with local community organizers around the country. For instance, in Oakland, after the murder of Oscar Grant, Prince spent a lot of time there. He was meeting with organizers, with activists, with families. He did the same in Baltimore and elsewhere. And often anonymously, anonymously, as you heard earlier, he quietly funded grassroots campaigns and organizations engaged in struggles against police brutality and for civil rights, economic, and environmental justice. He took on a Harry Belafonte-like role, bridging freedom fighters and cultural leaders. He organized private salons for folks to meet and talk to each other. Unlike Belafonte, chose to quietly do this, to largely remain a student rather than a spokesperson. And that's one of the tragedies of him not living longer than he did. He might have decided that it was time for him to take a stand alongside this new breed of leaders. I think it's also telling that after his struggle with Warner Brothers ended with him resigning to the label and gaining control of his master recordings, that he began making some of the best music of his career. I think tragedy might have clarified the path of the Purple Moses. In the years after his son Amir uh, died, his parents died, he retreated to lyricless, free-flowing blues and jazz jams. And then his words seemed to return as he received the recognition he had once worked so hard to attain. Uh, he owned the stage, right? Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Grammys, like he'd never left. And now he spoke to wartime racism, to climate justice, to the divided nation. Some of the best music of his latter years, Dreamer, Baltimore, Black Sweat, Black Muse, rev reveal both a new complexity and a return to familiar themes. I, I like to think of Call My Name, right, which has him spotlighting lovemaking as the ultimate act of creativity and resistance and transformation. In Do Me Baby, he'd sung to his lover, I'm not going to stop until the war is over. And now he couldn't help but insert an entire verse linking their coupling to saving the planet from the surveillance state and the forever war. And so in concert, he slotted in covers of his favorite songs, right? Just My Imagination, where a winner rocked steady along his own. He provided history lessons for the kids. He provided ample evidence of his own enduring importance. He featured women prominently, and he seemed at ease and perfectly happy with the role of respected elder. In public and private, he represented mastery and generosity. 
And so on March 4, 2016, my partner and I, and 20,000 others, attended this piano and microphone show at the Oracle Arena in Oakland. And it looked like a Paisley Park dream with Oakland specificity. Women in Saturday fly, sequins and stilettos, men in purple suits, Raiders hats, Warriors jerseys, rainbow children drawn in an almost holy kind of ritual. My friend Boots Rowdy was there and we got, talking, we got to talking about how Prince had stolen his DJ, <laughs> Pam the Functress, and renamed her Purple Pam, which Pam had hilariously complicated feelings about. <laughs> Rest in peace, Pam. As the lights dimmed, Prince wheeled out from backstage on a purple bike, his cane over his forearm. And the screens above displayed colorful images of moving fractals as if he had just read Adrian Marie Brown's emergent strategy. And he mounted a stage in the center of the arena where there was only a piano and electric keyboard and we cheered and we cheered and he teased, remember that time we first met? That was good. Then he hunched over the black and white keys and he went to work solo, some of the most beautiful labor we had ever heard. He played a delicate version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Then he transitioned to Somewhere Here on Earth, which ends with the words, it's time to heal. No, no more hurt as long as I'm here on Earth. And he followed with Baltimore, extending that feeling into this dialogue with Ice Cube and Martin Luther King and Michael Brown and Freddie Gray and all the young rebels in Baltimore. And later he played Controversy and I Would Die For You as a medley, these manifestos of coming together. And he threaded together Bob Marley's Waiting in Vain, If I Was Your Girlfriend and How Come You Don't Call Me Anymore, songs of unbearable longing. And we hung on to every syllable, every tremor in his voice, every exhalation. In each and every note we came to feel the high wire he was crossing over us. That not only did each sound need to be a beautiful sound, but also a constellation. The songs forming a sky in which we could see our own desires and everyone else's. And we began to react to each other's reactions. And so when he pressed some buttons on his synthesizer and it spit out the beat to when doves cry, our screams, for more, what else, rose into a roaring cascade of belief. And by the end of the second encore, we were on our feet chanting, free yourself. And he stepped to the side of the stage, north, east, west, south, and he repeated the same gesture. He raised his hands in an arc over his head and then he bowed deeply, which only made us try to find that deeper sound in our chests. And when he disappeared into the darkness, we stomped and we clapped. And when he came back on stage, he played two chords and sang, until the end of time, I'll be there for you. Who couldn't have been overcome? And what couldn't have been overcome? And then more than two hours after he started, he was gone. Thanks very much for listening.